it's, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, I was just talking to uh, John Valentine, and he said, this must be a really great day for you. And I said, no, that's tomorrow. <laughs> in fact, I was, I was telling uh, the folks in my office that ne after next week's convocation, I'm going to go to the airport with $800 cash in my pocket and give it to the ticket taker and say, however far away I can get. <laughs> Well, I want to tell you a little bit about this building and a little bit about this college, um, and I'm, I'm not going to speak very long. But um, I, I actually became dean here the same year uh, Moses came off the mountain with the tablets. <laughs> and uh, I, I recognized immediately that we didn't have enough space. The science building we have uh, that we have lived in for these years uh, is 60,000 square feet for all of our sciences. The building that you're sitting in is 160,000 square feet. So we add that to the 60 that we've got. And we have room now to do science. Uh, not only that, it's a cutting edge building. It's, uh, there, there, there's nothing in here that is second class. And the, uh, the classrooms, the teaching spaces are marvelous. And I'll tell you just a little bit about that. First off, um, the genesis of this building. I, I first uh, went to the uh, Capitol Hill 11 years ago to make a proposal for a science building. Uh, then I went 10 years ago, then I went nine years ago, then I went eight years ago, and so on and so forth. And then Holland comes along, and in two years, we're standing in this auditorium. So. <laughs> I, I, want you, I want to know if you think that's fair. Well, let me tell you a little bit um, about our college. Uh, we, uh, when, when I came here a little over 10 years ago, uh, we had 54 faculty. We now have 115 faculty members. Uh, we had two advisors. We now have uh, eight advisors. Uh, and we had, uh, uh, let's, let's see, I'm trying to think. We had one baccalaureate degree, one bachelor's degree in biology. We now have 20. Uh, and are not seeking anymore. We're, we're now seeking excellence. But uh, I, I, I wanted to just mention some things about the university. When we were beginning to uh, ask and seek to expand and, and become a full-fledged university, we knew we had to, we knew, and actually a, a full-bred uh, 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 college, College of Science, of, uh, uh, Utah Valley State College, we knew we had to have more baccalaureate programs. And so I was in the hot seat at the regent's uh, office for uh, a long time. No one thought UVSC, UVU uh, would or could become what we have. Uh, and it was uh, for the first five years when I was in standing in the Board of Regents meeting, it was war. Uh, everybody against me. Uh, but uh, we, we actually, we, we were able to turn the tide because of our faculty and because of the quality of our students. And you, you will be interested to know that we put more than the national average by a long ways into medical and dental schools. We also are uh, putting a, a, an awfully lot of our graduates into physicians assistant school and physical therapy schools. It's, um, it's quite remarkable. And our, our placement rates in, from this college are very high. We, uh, we put people in positions. Our, their employees, uh, the employers love them. And in fact, uh, uh, I've had two or three uh, trips to the hospital recently and asked the nurses all where they're from and talked to the docs. And they all prefer nurses from Utah Valley. Uh, so did I, by the way. Uh, <laughs> One of the very nice things about this college uh, and that people in this valley and along the Wasatch Front understand is our graduates stay put uh, or they go off to medical school and come back. So uh, our uh, competing institution in the valley is a wonderful institution. We're, we're very uh, collaborative with them. But they're students from all over the country. So they finish their degrees and go home. Uh, and, and they have uh, uh, high attrition rates in their positions. So folks uh, uh, out there employing our students love it because our students stay, stay in place. And that's a, that's a strong, strong issue for us. 
There's another thing about, uh, about our college that I, that I dearly love. Um, first off, we're very collegial. We like each other. Uh, and I will talk just a little bit about that uh, in our planning stages. We, uh, under Governor Herbert, uh, two, uh, three years ago, got planning money for this building, and we had a year to plan it. We worked with the planners, and they said they'd never worked with a more collegial group, uh, never had less trouble planning. And then we worked with GSBS architects. Uh, they said the same thing, that uh, we, they, they had no idea that academics could be decent. So uh, <laughs> we, we were. <laughs> and now uh, I met with my faculty last week, and we, we are now moving. Uh, we'll be moving into this building in the coming few days. And I said, let's, let me say, we will continue to be collegiate. And let me also say, I'll see you in a week. I'm going on a week's uh, t a trip, a research conference. <laughs> But uh, we, have a, we have a wonderful faculty. I, uh, many of my faculties, faculty members could teach anywhere in the country. Uh, and they choose to, to come here and to stay here. And that, it's, it's really quite amazing. The other thing that has been happening of late, uh, we have become much more collaborative. And we actually feel like a sister school now with BYU, uh, with Westminster, and with the University of Utah and Slick. We have people on all of those campuses. They have people on our campus. Uh, and we are doing marvelous collaborative work. We're sharing equipment. We're sharing brains. Uh, and we're sharing uh, research space. Now, a little bit about this building. This auditorium you're standing in. Sit, no, you're sitting, aren't you? Uh, this building holds uh, 400 uh, people. We'll seat 400 people. This is the first time we've ventured into a, a teaching situation like this. Uh, that we are going to be teaching six, maybe seven sections in this class this coming fall uh, and uh, w of different sorts that lend themselves to a large section. Um, so it's, uh, we have a, quite an experiment ahead of us with, uh, with a large teaching and we'll see, see how that goes. And we're hoping, of course, uh, in the future, in the near future, to get a classroom building and so this will be an experiment with a 400 seat uh, classroom. I actually have taught in uh, classrooms of this size many times, and so has President Holland. Uh, we, we, we think it will work. Uh, we hope it will work. Uh, so it, it, our, our growth has been so phenomenal, we almost had no choice. We will, we will run uh, nearly 20,000 students a semester through this, uh, through this building in the classrooms and, uh, and in this auditorium. So you can see that takes, uh, plus we have 50 new offices. That takes some of the heat off of us, um, but we still are, we have a long ways to go as far as space is concerned and as far as some of our facilities. We, we feel very, very fortunate to have this new building. Um, it, it is one of the things that has to happen now for students to go to medical and dental schools and professional schools is they're, they're almost required to do research. And our faculty uh, are wonderful mentors so that they each, most of our faculty work with two to four or six undergraduate students doing hands-on research. Much of it gets published. Steve Emmerman, I saw him here somewhere in the crowd. He is in the Earth Science Department. He took 40 students last year to various professional meetings to give papers. Uh, we, we are really, uh, uh, it, we used to be the best kept secret in Utah. Uh, the secret's getting out. Uh, we, we are the real deal. And I, I want to thank each of you for coming today and for contributing to, um, to, to the construction and the, uh, the ability for us to have and make this new building. Governor, thank you. Th thank you. Jason, thank you. Uh, John and uh, Margaret and others, and Commissioner uh, Cedarberg and Vice Commissioner Hitch. And uh, oh, heck, I could go on and on, couldn't I? <laughs> But there have been very many people who have been instrumental in this. Uh, Danny Horns worked, uh, and David Jordan, my two assistant deans, uh, worked very hard with Big D. And I'll tell you, uh, whereas I've had plenty of headaches with this building, uh, Big D was wonderful to work with. Uh, we could get them on the phone. Uh, they answered our uh, questions immediately and would be on the spot within an hour. Uh, fix, fixing what needed to be fixed. And we still own them, quote, own them, <laughs> for a year. 
So a anything that breaks, they're going to get more phone calls. <laughs> but but uh, we, are, we are thrilled with this uh, facility. It's more than we expected. And I, I'd like to thank every one of you for your help uh, and for coming today. Thank you. We're now going to hear from President Holland uh, uh, for a few minutes, so uh, thank you. Well, this is uh, such a glorious, positive moment that uh, I hate to start on this note, it's, but it's actually painful for me right now because I'm forced to say some nice things about Sam Rushforth publicly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put it this way, based on how the last couple of Dean's councils have gone, when Sam calls that travel agent, she'll have already had a few suggestions about where he can go. <laughs> so I'm going to say it. Sam has done an outstanding job with producing this college. Uh, he's brought together, uh, first and foremost, a faculty. Uh, I think as we've shown, here at UVU, uh, you can uh, do a lot of things in creative ways and get buy-in facilities if you have to. But what you can't skimp on are the people, are the faculty, are the minds that inspire uh, the students that walk through the halls of this campus. And his, uh, if there's a legacy he leaves, it is the attraction and cultivation and mentorship of a truly outstanding set of faculty who now have a physical facility worthy of their great accomplishment. I'd call for a round of applause just for that. It's an honor to have uh, the governor with us today and many other dignitaries, uh, Congressman Chaffetz, uh, Commissioner Cedarberg. Um, I see the mayors, uh, regents, trustees, a uh, number of our legislators uh, who I'll uh, speak about uh, later, but welcome to Utah Valley University for this truly historic moment. This is a new chapter in the history and the exciting arc of this institution that consistently surprises people and exceeds expectations about who we are and where we're headed. And uh, I couldn't be more excited about what this means. It's a thrill to me that later this afternoon we will be hosting our presidential lecture uh, for this semester in this room, uh, the second big event, if you will, in this room with a, a nationally distinguished a lecturer coming to speak about autism. If you've been reading the papers, you'll see that uh, Utah has the highest rate of autism of, of any state in the country. And so for me, this is, uh, that's a sad fact that we have to face, but uh, on the other hand, I think it says something important about this institution, that from day one, what this institution will be about is whatever scholarly trends may be happening or not happening, we will be responsive to the community around us. We will be engaged with the world around us. You see our billboards and our posters. We're connected and determined to be responsive to the practical realities and the core needs of the world that we face. And we're doing that from day one with this conference and the speech that will be held today as we take our scientific inquiry and level and investigation to a whole new level and we'll be doing it all together in this first uh, wonderful opening day of this facility. So we'll talk a lot uh, today and throughout the rest of the day about the future of this institution, the future of this college, but I don't think it would be appropriate to move uh, so uh, uh, quickly into a discussion of the future without taking a minute to talk about the past. And uh, I have to uh, take just a moment to pay tribute to Margaret and uh, Bill Pope. Uh, and um, a number of years ago, the Popes, maybe uh, as soon or sooner than any other community figure, could see where this institution was going. 
and when perhaps a lot of the excitement and attention was directed at other institutions and other activities, they decided to get involved with then UVSC. And they uh, gave some stock uh, to us in a little company that they were creating uh, that turned uh, a quick million dollars that they then walked in and handed to Kerry Romsberg. And as I've heard this story described to me, Kerry Romsberg, who wasn't, had no idea that this was coming, uh, broke into tears, and Kerry was not uh, an emotional man. Uh, but he was so moved by this profound act of generosity, and it, it was that million dollars that got started the Pope Science Building, that for years and years has been the base of operations for building this world-class facility. And so uh, even as we move forward into this exciting new chapter and this exciting new building, a, a, a moment of appreciation for Margaret and Bill and the visionaries and past administrators who made the Pope Science Building happen, I think, would be appropriate. As we, uh, as we think and look at, uh, think about and look at this uh, fantastic building, there are so many people who need to be thanked and, and uh, paid tribute to. Uh, a number of donors, I'm going to resist uh, the temptation to mention any donors by name here. There are so many of them, but also we will be featuring donors uh, as soon as we start uh, the ribbon cutting exercise and in a special VIP lunch, and so I'll, I'll save uh, our tributes to them for just a moment. Uh, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, a number of people who really step forward at, at key moments uh, to help make this happen. Uh, Governor, uh, we wouldn't be here without you and your support uh, at a key moment in the legislative process and, and your support uh, for this building. You were joined. Senator Valentine, Senator Bramble, who's here somewhere close, uh, Senator Bramble, uh, Senator Dayton, uh, who I know is here, uh, all, all three of them played really instrumental roles in uh, key moments of the decision that led to the uh, decision to fund the science building. And uh, I want to thank you folks for your, for your legislative support. Uh, there's someone from the UVU side uh, who's uh, watched this uh, project probably as long as anybody, um, and that's uh, Val Peterson. Can I ask Val Peterson, uh, Vice President, to stand for just a moment? Uh, now Representative Val Peterson. So. My immediate predecessor was Dr. Liz Hitch, uh, now serving in the commissioner's office. And it would be easy to miss, but it would be a grave mistake to miss the central role that she played in all of this. Uh, during that one year of being an interim president, which is not an easy role to perform, uh, she worked closely with Val Peterson and our legislators to secure planning money. And I know Dr. Hitch is here somewhere. Liz, uh, please, we, we thank you, Liz. For you. Finally, I'd like to say a word about our students. One of the real, for me, memorable aspects of the fight for the science building was the way the students got involved. Uh, they sold haircuts. They collected stinky shoes. Uh, that's a longer story we can talk about later. Uh, uh, they, uh, they marched on Capitol Hill. They, they phoned their uh, representatives. They signed petitions. and. At the front and center of that student eff effort was a very impressive young man named Christopher Lang. He was currently serving as the Senate representative for the College of Science, the faculty Senate representative for the College of Science. And uh, to say just a word about um, what it meant from the student perspective, but for students who are never going to uh, be able to take advantage of this building. Those students, for two or three years ago, fought as hard as they could, and they were never going to be able to take a class here. But they did it for their colleagues, 
and for future generations. And I'd like Chris to, to Chris, come on up here. I'm going to put him on the spot. I, I want you to see what an impressive young man he is. And would you take just a minute, Chris, to share a, a thought or two about your feelings about that process in this building for what it means for students? Um, I, I, I'm a little nervous to be here. Uh, I got the phone call a couple days ago to come speak with uh, President Holland. And luckily for them, I was shopping with the ring with my fiance. And in that mode, I was just like, yes, yes, whatever you want. You serve everyone. <laughs> so when I got the phone call, and it was like, Christopher, we need you to take off work and come down and speak with President Hall and to all these really important people. I was like, yeah, sure, fine. Where do I sign? And it was like, before I knew what happened, I was like, I think I'm supposed to go speak in a couple days. And so that was just really, but uh, my name is Christopher Lang. I am a graduate of UVU for one year. I currently work for a leading biotechnology company, uh, Myriad Genetics, here in Utah. Um, I'm very thankful for my opportunity to be a student here at UVU uh, to show you how amazing our education provides us. Even in this job market, six weeks after graduation, I started my first grown-up job. And in this economy, that's a miracle. UVU did amazing work with the limited space we had. When I returned from my LDS mission, um, I, uh, I heard the complaints of, of hundreds of students complaining about the small class sizes, the having to delay graduation, and I wanted to get involved. And so for my entire college career, I worked with student government. I worked with, uh, in the hallways, listening to students. We then, as he, President Holland said, we collected as many smelly shoes as we could get. We got money for those. We gave haircuts in the hallway, which we had art people do it because scientists, we, we can clone you, but we can't cut your hair. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We really can't clone you, but anyway. <laughs> um, but... What was really impressive to me is how many students took the time to call their state legislatures. How many students signed our petition? We had over 3,000 students sign saying, we want the science building. And I think one of the greatest opportunities was I, was I had the chance to speak with President Holland many times. Somebody asked me, why are you doing this? Because I will never take a class here. I'm already working in the job field. I will never research here. But I knew that this building would benefit the state of Utah. Thousands of more students like myself who I get to voice, future nurses, healthcare providers, research associates that will benefit this great state will come from this building. And that's why I dedicated my college life to be here. For those students that were, at, were freshmen and the students that will come and for the great state. I am so thankful for everybody that played a part, for the opportunity that I had to help build this great institution. And above all, for the donors who gave money, the legislatures who listened to me call them on the phone over and over and over again. And for all of you that helped, thank you for this wonderful building. and sound of that applause uh, was not missed on anybody. Take a good look at this young man and let's just remember maybe this moment above all others. This is why we did what we did with legislators, uh, with regents. I, I, I should have mentioned our great regents, uh, uh, Marlon Snow, Wilford Clyde, Dan Campbell, who stepped forward at key moments for it. Regents, trustees, legislators, governor, uh, faculty, we did it for Christopher Lang and thousands and thousands and thousands of others just like him. It's all yours. I have one, uh, one thought I'd like to close with uh, here. Uh, it's a larger point about uh, the significance of this building and what we'll be doing here at Utah Valley University moving forward. It's a charge to uh, the faculty of this great college and to the leadership uh, uh, of the college. Francis Bacon was an attorney general and Lord Chancellor of England as we moved from the 1500s into the 1600s. He wrote a book called The Great Instauration. And uh, it's not a title immediately recognizable to a lot of people, but it exercised a profound impact on the world around us, greater than most of us will ever know or appreciate. 
what he was arguing for was that we needed to change the way we thought about things, change the way we acquired knowledge in the world around us. What he argued for is that we needed, needed to move away from what was at that time uh, a tendency in all spheres of life towards deductive reasoning, to look at the general, the theoretical, the philosophical first, and then try to explain the world around us. He said we need to reverse that. We need to, we need to, uh, we need to study things inductively. We need to start at the local, the particular, the specific. And so he argued for inductive reasoning and for empiricism for looking at the world as it is and to di dissect it and to magnify it and to look at it more closely and carefully and then build up our general principles from that. In other words, what he was advocating was the scientific method. And he is one of the fathers, if not the father, of the scientific method that now governs the professional and academic activities of this office. And uh, as I say, it's, it was one of those works uh, along with several others and uh, other people that created the modern world in which we live. The magnificent technology, the magnificent scientific breakthroughs came about because someone smart and intelligent stepped back and said, we need to think about things a little bit differently. And it did dramatically change the way that we were able to figure out how the natural world works and how we could then try to uh, channel that natural world to our benefit and to our use. And Francis Bacon understood that what he was talking about would produce great power. That if you could understand first and then channel the natural world, that it would be a collection of great power. That the scientific method, if you will, was a way to acquire power. Now, the charge I would give to our faculty and administrators moving forward is to appreciate two things. First, is that the scientific method, as powerful as it is, cannot explain everything. Like, for instance, what are the purposes to which power, however it is acquired, should be used? And the second is to use just a phrase from Francis Bacon himself then about how power, scientific power, scientific knowledge should be used. This is from the introductory remarks of uh, Francis Bacon's The Great Instauration. He says, lastly, I would address one general admonition to all that they consider what are the true ends of knowledge and that they seek it not either for pleasure of the mind or for contention or for superiority to others or for profit or fame or political power or any of these inferior things, but for the benefit and use of life and that they perfect and govern it in charity. That's the charge I give to this faculty moving forward is that we use the great power, the great facilities of this new structure and all that it means with its laboratories and classrooms and office space to think great thoughts and to do great experiments and to do great research to inspire the next generation in a way that will produce knowledge and therefore produce power that will be used with compassion and understanding and an appreciation for the sanctity and respect and dignity of all human life everywhere. That is my charge to you, and I do it again in celebration of this great event and with profound appreciation for everyone who's made it possible. Thank you very much. It's now my uh, pleasure and honor to turn some time over to Governor Herbert to address us. Well, thank you, President. It's an honor for me to be here. And as I have had the opportunity to take a little bit of a tour here a little earlier and uh, mingle with some of you here, it's an impressive sight. It's impressive to see how many people are involved here at Utah Valley University and the contribution that each one has made over a long period of time to get us to this point here today. And I certainly, on behalf of uh, the state of Utah, thank you for your efforts because you are doing great and wonderful things that make this state great and wonderful. I'm honored to be here with uh, all of you. Uh, we have many dignitaries here that have already been mentioned, but. One that I certainly want to mention is that the First Lady of the State of Utah is here with me, and uh, Jeanette. Uh, I 
Uh, some of you may know and have heard that there's a, an election going on. And uh, I don't want to make a crass political announcement, but I would suggest to you the best reason to reelect me as governor is you get Jeanette back as the first lady. <laughs> so I'm honored to have Jeanette with me. And uh, again, I, I would say the same thing about President Holland. We ought to keep him around because Paige stays as the first lady at UVU. You know, Some of you know this, and I don't want to uh, bore you again with my um, past history here associated with this uh, institution. As some of you know, uh, I just live up the street a few blocks here from uh, UVU. And uh, I was born in American Fort, but raised really in Orem uh, from the time I was about six. My family moved here. A lot of you know my father, Dwayne Herbert, and uh, his contribution to the community of Orem. But uh, I've had the opportunity in my life to see the expansion in significant ways of this institution. From its beginnings as a, a, a central vocational school down in Provo, to the Utah Trade Technology College, which I actually went to and, and went to classes during summer school. I, I hasten to add, I didn't have to do that, by the way. I, uh, <laughs> I, I chose to do that. And um, I actually was taught drafting. And uh, who knew, but in later in life with working with dad and as we built homes and sold real estate, I had an opportunity to use that skill that I developed in this institution when it was down in Provo. Later on, got to teach in the evening school uh, down there and here in the new campus uh, where I taught real estate courses here. And so in some ways, I was a professor here at, uh, at this great school. And to see the transition, uh, working on their foundation board as we tried to raise money and uh, make it a little more noticeable here in the community and as the opportunity to expand. I remember working with the Board of Trustees and as I was elected as a county commissioner, invited to come before the Board of Regents and talk about why it was so important that we got some four-year uh, degrees here at the school. And I remember Marlon and Snow coming up and giving me a rah-rah talk about what we needed to do and say at the Board of Regents to see if we couldn't convince them that we needed to have something more here in Utah County besides just Brigham Young University. And uh, that was the beginnings of uh, the expansion and uh, four-year school institution and eventually working with our great legislators to university status. And now uh, as our fastest growing university in the state, we see another milestone that takes place here today with this new Science Center. And Dean Rushforth is certainly proud, as kind of the papa here of this uh, new inst uh, department here in, on campus, this new building, as we have an opportunity to, to, in fact, lengthen again our opportunities here in this educational environment and needful for the success of our state going forward. Um, you know, I'll just mention a couple of things that probably are worth saying, and then I'll sit down. We have significant needs in this state to have educational attainment and achievement that goes beyond what we've done in the past. Status quo is not acceptable. We need, in fact, to raise the bar on many way, in many ways, not only through our just public education, but clearly moving beyond uh, uh, high school diplomas. Uh, we have set a goal in this state to have what we call 66 by 2020. That means that 66% of our adult population by the year 2020 will have some kind of post-high school certification or a degree. It, uh, we have naysayers out there that say it can't be done. President Holland's been in some of the discussions. Some of our Board of Regents know about this, that it can't be done. That's where we're trying to jump too far, too far and too high. But here's the sad truth, based on a study done out of Georgetown University by Professor Carnivali, who's assessed our economic achievement and economic opportunity. If we do not reach that level of education, our economy starts to underperform. Now, we've just come out of a very difficult economic downturn, uh, the worst economic uh, time since the Great Depression. We call it, in fact, the Great Recession. That's how bad it's been. Uh, we are turned to the corner on that. We are doing very well, certainly in comparison to the rest of the country right now, with an economy that's growing over twice the national average. 
But if we don't uh, reach and attain this level of 66 by 2020, we will not have continued economic expansion. We'll, we'll uh, tail off and not expand as we're capable of doing. That would be unfortunate, not only for all of us, but for the rising generation. So the STEM uh, programs, which we're trying to emphasize, again, with the help of good legislators, uh, leadership that we get out of Washington, D.C. with our congressman, we understand the importance of having more involvement in science, technology, engineering, and math as part of what the marketplace is demanding of our labor. We've got to make sure that our labor force out there aligns up with the demands of the marketplace, and the STEM uh, programs are important for us. Uh, it's interesting for me to note that the STEM uh, educational fields have grown at 6.2 percent per year uh, since 1950. That's nearly four times the rate of growth of any other field out there in our sectors in our, in our economy. So it's a great field. Chris has picked a good uh, field to, be, to go into business in and to have a good job. And uh, we need to make sure that we have those opportunities. It's estimated that over the, uh, the, uh, the next year, uh, six years alone, we'll have a need for 101,000 STEM-related jobs. The question is going to be, can we produce them? Uh, I've had a number of companies that are Fortune 500 companies that are expanding in Utah where we say to them, we'd like you to hire more people. We, wanna, we have a goal of 100,000 jobs in 1,000 days. Can you hire more people? And uh, unfortunately, the response comes back to me too often is, you know, we've got a couple hundred jobs right now that we can't fill because we don't have labor force that has the skills necessary for us to hire them. So we're going to put more onus on those involved in education. We're going to actually have to lengthen our stride a bit to make sure that it's not just K through 12, but K through 16. That we have opportunities for education in our higher uh, institutions of higher learning, which is going to put pressure on us in the legislature and as a state for additional funding. That's just the harsh reality. We need to find ways to be more efficient. UVU is a great example of getting great quality education for lower cost. Under President Holland's leadership and before him, President Cedarburg, this institution does a great job of educating more for less, just like we're doing in state government. It's something you have to do in the business world. It's something we've got to find ways to do in the educational world, too. Last but not least, uh, we just came from some different uh, uh, bill signings that we had with some of our legislators here today, and one was at a charter school. And uh, young people that are just bushy-eyed and uh, bushy-tailed and bright-eyed, is that how it goes? <laughs> Get my metaphors mixed up here. Um, you know, they're, they're bright and, and happy and optimistic about the future. And uh, they should be, because our future is very bright. Uh, but one of the things we're trying to teach our young people is the simple idea that if you want a good job, if you want to have opportunity in life, you need to have a good education. That should be part of our culture. You want opportunity in life and in this great country of, uh, filled with opportunity, the key to open the door to opportunity is education. And uh, not only is it a key to opportunity, but it does make so that you have opportunity to get a good paying job. STEM uh, programs, in fact, on average now uh, across the country pay $75,000 a year plus benefits. So they're good paying jobs. People can really uh, make a good livelihood. And so I'm, I appreciate the role that this uh, institution is now going to be able to play at, a, at a, even a higher degree with this science center. Uh, let me just conclude by saying this. Again, UVU is such a, a great asset to this state. Uh, again, as a, our fastest growing institution, I know we had a, a, a lot of people have stepped up to help in the funding of this, uh, private donors, the Bingham family and the Pope family and, and others, and the legislature recognizing the need and the responsibility that we have as part of our budgetary requirements to make sure that we take care of education, not just K through 12, but now K through 16 and beyond. Uh, this is a, a significantly uh, expensive building. It is estimated to cost $50 million with what we have here. The good news in true Utah fashion, this was not only on time but under budget. 
about $40 million as opposed to the $50 million estimated to cost. And, uh, you know, a million saved is a million earned, you know, I say. <laughs> and uh, so uh, congratulations to everybody. That was a great effort by everybody. Um, let me just conclude here by saying congratulations to one and all. When I came into office, I talked about the need to have unprecedented partnerships. Uh, we all believe in collaboration and cooperation, but we need to do it in unprecedented ways. And if we would do that, we would have unlimited opportunities to progress. Sometimes we talk past each other instead of talking with each other, particularly in the educational environment. I see some of that going on today, and it's disappointing. Uh, there's room for everybody to participate in education. We need to start pulling together because we don't have a lot of money to waste. And as long as we're not pulling together, as long as we're having some of the, the fights of I'm right and you're wrong, the ones who suffer are our students. Now, I'm a firm believer of what President Holland and Chris said, and it is a truism for all of us to realize. We build today for those who come tomorrow. What's being done and what people have done here and, and over the last number of generations was for not themselves necessarily, but those who were to follow. Utah Valley University is emblematic of those people who over a number of years, over generations, have built today for those who are going to come later and are the beneficiaries of the work of so many people. So congratulations to one and all. This has been a team effort that's brought us to this significant uh, milestone in Utah Valley's uh, history. And I think it's just one of many more milestones that will happen as we go forward in this great state. And if we work together, Utah will always maintain its lofty position of being a great place to live, a, a great place to raise family, and a great place to do business. Thank you very much.